This is the first in a sermon series about believing, belonging and becoming. And it should help anybody to understand what it means to be a member of a church, specifically the Methodist Church. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. May God bless our reading, hearing, understanding and doing of his word. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to talk to you about the first in this uh, set of things that we do, believe, belong, and become. And I'm also going to tell you about how pigeons find their way home. So you're going to have to pay attention to the sermon in case you want to know how pigeons find their way home. And uh, it's quite interesting, and I think it's only in 2004 that they've made some of the latest, 2024, that they've made some of the latest discoveries. As Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said something quite difficult for them to, to comprehend or understand. And I think maybe you, you heard what he was saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you can't, you know, it's, and you think, oh my goodness, I don't want to eat a person I've already eaten today. But Jesus was saying something more at that time, we understand that. And so Simon Peter said to him, just after this, uh, Jesus had asked, are you, are you going to leave me too? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And so as we talk about believing, we understand that that was a major theme of John's Gospel, about coming to believe. And part of that coming to believe would be coming to belong, especially in that early church where if you confessed that Jesus was Lord, then you were saying that Caesar was not Lord, and you'd find yourself in trouble with the authorities because you were protesting against the ruling party of the day. Believing led to belonging, and that's probably the most important thing that I want to talk about in these three weeks, because I think we've forgotten the importance of belongingness. The importance of helping other people to know that they belong and also of knowing that we belong. In years gone by, people made a great fuss of their membership certificates and would frame them and stick them up somewhere. People would write them in their Bibles and they would just have one special Bible and they would look at that Bible and say, yes, I remember that day on which I was baptized and I belong." And if there was trouble in the community, people would rally together to make sure that they helped each other against all that trouble. A few days ago, a friend of mine said, why are politicians so divisive about all the things that politicians are so divisive about? And the truth is, as Jesus said it, you can divide and conquer, can't you? We're talking about belonging. I can't remember if I dreamt this I think it might be fiction, but it might be real. Many years ago, I got an, an email from somebody who had been a member of the church. I think, dear Rev Kelly, you are not happy with, you can imagine what anybody might not be happy with. I mean, we're not here to make you happy. So after attending TVMC for dot, dot, dot years, we will be attending dot, dot, dot church from now on. I guess they might have said lots of love, but I'm sure it was written with love. Because, you know what, I, I say one measure of being a member of a church is that if ever you left, you would write a letter to say, hey, thanks, uh, it was good to be here, but uh, I've got to go, go along to the next place. I don't think I did write this letter back, but I wanted to write this letter back. Dear blah, 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 thank you for letting me know. May I suggest that instead of attending a church, you join one. Don't just attend church. 
I mean, I, I, I know I'm, I'm amusing and funny, and, and we have nice music and stuff. It might be tempting to come and attend the, the 9 a.m. or the 11 a.m. show at Table View Methodist. And if it was a show, we'd sell popcorn, we give tea afterwards, so that's cool. But it's not a show that you attend. It's a community that you are a part of, and it, it's appealing to be part of this community because it's full of wonderful people. And sometimes it's not actually that full of wonderful people, and that's why Dallas Willard is famous for saying of church, where else would I learn to love my enemies? Because it's like family. You, you can sort of church, choose your church, but you can't really. It's like you can't choose your family. Somehow you find yourself belonging to a church because you were born and your parents could drag you along to a certain church, and you found that you belonged and you found that something happened as you came to belong. And so I talk about believing, belonging, and becoming. And it doesn't necessarily happen in that order. I can tell you my story of, of coming to believe, to belong, to the church. And it didn't start with believing or becoming. It started with belonging. My cousins took me to church with them, and uh, I was in grade standard 8, which they call grade 10 now. Uh, and in grade standard 8 in those days, they had a, a, a standard 8 dance, and you needed to take a girl to the standard 8 dance if you went to an all-boys school. And my cousin said, well, there's girls at church. And so I went along to church. I also played the saxophone. And I realized that I couldn't really sing the songs at church because I didn't believe them. And there was a lovely guy called George. He's like a, like a fully country guitar player, loved his music, led the worship at the church. And I said to him, listen, I'm not comfortable singing these songs. Do you mind if I play the sax? And he said, cool. And I found that I belonged. I belonged not because of what I believed or because I belonged there, I belonged because they were kind. They were nice and friendly, and they let me be a part of the community. They weren't worried that this non-Christian saxophone player would blow demons through his saxophone or some other weird thing that somebody might think. They thought God's love is enough for this funny fella. I was a teenager looking for girls to date. Trouble. But as I belonged, and I returned every Sunday, and I listened to the songs, and I learned the words because I learned to play the sax. I started to think, hey, maybe I do believe this stuff. And as I started to believe, I started to become a little different. I used to swear more than most, I think. I used to be a little bit bitter and jaded. I probably still am in many ways. But I noticed that something was changing. I was becoming different. One of the, the songs that our, our worship leader loved at that time was Shine, Jesus, Shine. And man, that blows on the saxophone, guys. Yeah, I did have fun playing the sax. I don't play the saxophone anymore because I like singing now because I believe the words and I like playing the guitar. But it made me think that becoming part made me think of 2 Corinthians 3.18. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. As we belong and we believe, we find that we are transformed. We are transformed by these strange people who, who love us. It was a very weird thing to go to this church with people who were so different to me and then they were organizing hikes for us kids and taking us out on picnics and camps and wonderful things, investing in listening to us and we even eventually got ourselves a youth pastor and it was awesome. We belonged, we believed and became transformed. So Jesus spoke about believing. He had said a very odd thing. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Like I said, it's confusing when you hear it now, especially in a 21st century world where we think that everything we read must be taken literally. But that's not how people spoke back in those days. They spoke in symbolic language. And as John wrote, he was writing to a church that was familiar with this meal that Jesus had established after he died. Before he died, sorry. But was established after his death. The meal of communion. But also the symbolism that Jesus had been speaking of, the bread of the word. The message that God has been pouring out into the world. The message that Jesus came to give to the world. The message about grace, and love, inclusion and transformation and change. When you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are eating my words, Jesus is telling us. You are becoming a bit more like me. You're starting to have the same kind of values that I have. You're starting to love the same people that I love and We know how controversial that was in Jesus' day. And so next week we will share communion. In the Methodist Church we have an open table. I love the formality of our 1975 prayer books directions. I always have to read these in a posh voice. At every celebration, the worshippers present should communicate unless there is good reason to the contrary. By communicate, it means have communion. All the worshippers present. In our confirmation and baptism services, we speak about what we believe. And in short, we ask three easy questions. Do you believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed humankind? You believe in the Holy Spirit who sanctifies the people of God. And the correct answer is given on all the slides, and you're welcome to join me in it as we say, we do. That's where I start to tell you about pigeons. I've got lots of gross stories about pigeons because my dogs think they're delicious. But that's another story. I've also noticed them looking at Hardy Dars recently. And I'm looking forward to that battle because I think my dogs will lose. But homing pigeons are the most amazing. You can take them miles and miles away and chuck them out of their stinky trailer. And for some reason, they fly back to their stinky home. We don't know why. Scientists have have had a few hypotheses and a few cruel experiments that have gone along with those hypotheses. I don't want to go too much into them, but they figured maybe their beaks were magnetic. That gave them a sense of where north was. Somehow deadening the nerves in the beaks, they found that it didn't make a difference to their navigation. They also thought that maybe neural networks in their brains were affected by the Earth's atmosphere, and, and somehow that made a difference. Then somebody did an experiment on something with their eyes. I I haven't got the references for this, so you just believe me on this, okay? I was listening to something on the radio a while ago. I thought it was quite cruel because they said, well, let's uh, see how homing pigeons find their way home. And a scientist who had hypothesized that it had something to do with their eyes covered... uh, took 20 homing pigeons and covered the left eye of 10 of them and covered the right eye of 10 of them and found that those who had their their left eye covered came home, but those who had their right eye covered got lost. So we're still not quite sure what they can see. You could say that we have no idea. Sorry, man. But the hypothesis is that there is something within their eye that reacts to the Earth's magnetosphere. And so as a pigeon looks out at the field or out at the world or flies over your head, he doesn't just see where to poop. 
he also sees something that you don't see. He sees maybe waves in the sky as, as the magnetic field of the earth goes around him. Maybe he sees all the, the earth kind of looking a little bit different. And if you had a conversation with a pigeon, you would think it was mad because it would say to you, well, can't you see that beautiful magnetic thingy mabob over there? And you would say, pigeon, you're mad. Then you wouldn't tell anyone because you were talking to a pigeon and you shouldn't talk to pigeons. But that's what we're saying when we say, what do you believe? We're saying, what do you see? And when we say, what do you see? We're talking about great God, the creator of heaven and earth. Jesus, his son, the redeemer of humankind, the Holy Spirit who sanctifies the people of God. We confess faith in a trinity, God. But as we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we also speak about what each of them do. To say that God is creator reminds us that God is before all things, and that is amazing. And it says a lot about all that exists, because if God is good, and all that exists is created by God, then all that exists could possibly be very good, like it says at the beginning. And God has created amazing things from neutron stars so dense and heavy that light can't escape the gravitational field, where if you dropped a marshmallow on them, it would explode with the strength of 5,000 atomic bombs. Wouldn't that be just wild? To the tiny little bee-sized hummingbird, that hovers and flits around on the mountains of the Andes, created by God. Created by God who is good. God is good and created all things means that we see the world like those pigeons with their odd eyes. We see something different. So when I ask, and you better come with the right answer, do you believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth? You answer, but there is more. We're finding our direction here because we also believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed humankind. This teaches us not just something about who Jesus is, but something about who God is because in the tradition of the first century, the Son was a carbon copy of the Father. Everything that Jesus does is a revelation of who the Father is. All our ideas of what God was like that come from before Jesus don't count anymore because Jesus is the full and final and complete revelation of the nature and heart of God. God, who is the creator of heaven and earth, the redeemer of humankind. And so this starts to speak also to our belonging. I love the words of uh, Desmond Tutu. He's fond of saying, there is no such thing as a hopeless case. You'd say that of South Africa, as people said, there's no way we're ever going to see change here. There is no such thing as a hopeless case. As we look at our friends and family, as we think of ourselves, and I know that each and every one of us knows somebody who's, who seems like a hopeless case, who's got lost, and we might sometimes feel like we are a hopeless case. But the Redeemer of humankind tells us to remember that we can be redeemed. We see who God is in who Jesus is. We are redeemed. One little theological dictionary describes redemption as the process by which sinful humans are brought back from the bondage of sin into relationship with God through grace by the payment of Jesus' death. That's just one angle on what it means to be redeemed because there's so many more pictures in the scriptures. But as we say that we believe, we're saying we believe something about the world in which we live. We believe something about the God who created it. And something quite optimistic, something of a way, of a journey line in what we know about Christ who redeems us. And so I ask, do you believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed humankind? And your answer is, I hope so. The third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, 
As God the Father reminds us what it means to believe. As Jesus reminds us, I guess, what it means to belong. We start to realize what it means to become. As we think about who the sanctifier of the people of God is. Sanctifier is a lovely word. It's from Latin. And I've got some other Latin words for you just now. Big one. Sanctus means holy. When we say that the Holy Spirit sanctifies the people of God, we're saying that the Holy Spirit makes us holy. And our understanding of holiness is not fancy and poo-poo and and wonderful and, and much better than you. But holiness in the New Testament is to love as God loves. That's to love your enemies and your friends. That is to love fully, as Wesley would say, asking his members if they had the love of God in their hearts. He would say, do your bowels yearn over them? Do you love the people that you meet? Do your bowels yearn over them? Another reference to pigeons, I'm sure. But he meant, do you feel that love for the people that you meet in the pit of your stomach? And it's so easy to deaden that love in a world that's so full of need. We are being transformed by the Holy Spirit, like I said from 2 Corinthians, into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. We're becoming more like Jesus. We're being transformed. We're being changed. Like those pigeons that see the magnetosphere of the earth, we see in the light of God the Father, the Creator, God the Son, the Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. So I ask you, do you believe in the Holy Spirit who sanctifies the people of God? Sure. Thank goodness. (coughs) Now we can baptize and confirm you. But believing is sometimes a little controversial, isn't it? Because even though we might believe some things that are the same, in the Trinitarian God, you find that we're worshipping here this morning and they're worshipping there and there's somebody worshipping down there and then there's some other guys who worship on a different day to us and we find we're not all the same. And I laugh thinking that God probably doesn't see our differences as badly as we see them. But we believe something specific. But within the Methodist Church, we have a very broad idea of what it means to believe. And so we find ourselves sometimes in controversy because some of us say that we should be allowed to celebrate the union of same-sex couples and we should celebrate sexuality in, in its different ways and others who say, no, you couldn't do that. Then you have some people who say that the earth was created in 6,000 years and that's that. And then we say, yeah, some people think that, but others also go with the 13.8 billion or what the John Webb Space Telescope is figuring us out, maybe 15 billion. You know, we're working it out. So Methodists aren't really that specific about what you have to believe to belong. We are a little more strict with our preachers. Every quarter I have to stand with the local preachers and ask, is there any objection on the ground that they do not believe and preach our doctrines? And uh, you guys don't write me enough letters about the preachers. You must write me a letter when the preachers preach nonsense so that I can review their theology and make sure that I hold them accountable. As a minister, I'm hauled before the synod once a year, and I stand nervously, and they ask, do you believe and teach sound Christian doctrine as held by the Methodist Church? And in front of all those people, I must say, I do. Or by the grace of God, I do. Ask the difficult question, do you duly observe and enforce our discipline? It means that sometimes I must tell you how to behave, and if I don't, I'll be in trouble. You should expect a lot from me in terms of my belief and my discipline and my adherence to our doctrine. Because I've stood up and said, yes, I believe these things. But Methodists don't expect you all to be Methodist ministers. You could if you wanted to, but you don't have to be. I like to say that we have low standards and high expectations. Low standards and high expectations. 
Anybody can belong. And we expect of everybody this journey to what we call Christian perfection, and that is perfect love. So I, I like a bit of Latin. I don't understand it, but I think this sounds cool. In necessaris unitas, in dubious libertas, in omnibus caritas. Ah, I say that every morning when I wake up. I wish I understood it, but the English is much easier. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That's our lowest standard. The center of our theology is, is an openness to learning and growing together. But we are not a church that's so much about what you believe, but what you become. We're a church of a method. And a method is a procedure or process for attaining an object. And that method leads to an objective, which is becoming more Christ-like. We talk about finding the way, like those homing pigeons. Our logo or our symbol is the scallop shell, the pilgrim shell. If one day you get to do a Camino trail or one of those amazing pilgrimages, to find your way along the way, you'll find these little shells pointing you in the right direction. And what they symbolize is a gathering together towards one point. Many different paths going to the same place. Many different paths leading us to where Christ would have us be. All of our diversity headed in one direction. Last complicated language for the day. I know you can't wait to have tea. And neither can I. The interesting words that we'll get into a little bit more next week, and I'll try to send them to you this week, is our conditions of church membership, as outlined in our Book of Order. Our Book of Order says to us that the conditions, privileges, and duties of membership in the Methodist Church follow the tradition common to the Methodist people from the beginning. Membership is not conditional upon the profession of theological tenets or dependent upon traditional authority or ecclesiastical ritual. That's a very broad statement, isn't it? It says that you don't have to have a certain theology to belong to this church. You don't even have to be, be authorized by the minister to belong to the church. The book contradicts itself a bit later when it talks about some more things. But it, it speaks about the fact that being part of the, member, the Methodist movement is not about those non-essentials. It goes on to say it is based upon a personal experience of the Lord Jesus Christ, brought about by the Spirit. And I mean, how can you define that? That could be just such a, a tiny touch of the heart. It's like, at what point did I become a member of the church? Yes, we formalized it when I was confirmed, but I started to become a member of the church by definition when Jesus started to you know, turn some of the screws in my brain. Ranging from the earliest signs of divine grace in the soul to its crowning blessedness and the joy of perfect love. Let's pray.